Uh, I've made two introductory videos, and now I'm going to move ahead and show some actual gameplay in Baron Victory. Uh, let's pull up the sequence of play chart. And you'll see this is a very traditional first player and then second player kind of sequence of play, where the first player does is allowed to take all of uh, his or her actions, and then the second player goes through the same sequence. Um, in Baron Victory, the first player is always the Confederacy, and the second player is, is always the Union. So we'll start the so we'll start the sequence of play by uh, by the Confederate player taking their actions. Um, the first phase in the sequence of play is the command phase, and this so this is where everything involving orders, the issuing and acceptance of orders, will be decided. And the first step in the command phase is issuing new orders. So the first question we'll consider is whether we want to issue any, whether the Confederacy wants to issue any new orders, and Bragg certainly does. Uh, let's take a look at our order chart to see where things. Uh, to see who has orders so far. Um, so each each of the two armies in the game will have this this uh, order chart um, with a with a series of columns uh, for all the information we'll order in the chart. Um, this is what I've got here is a little bit different than what's in the uh, uh, the actual rules of the game, but it's the it accomplishes the same thing. So. Uh, orders are numbered, uh, the content of the order goes in this field, uh, uh, the order will be, orders are generally sent from the army HQ, and the time at which they arrive at the, either the core headquarters or the division leader uh, of the recipient of the orders, the time of that is given here. Um, this is the command, or, you know, that is the the, the the division or core that's going to receive the orders. Uh, the sender will either will typically be the command the commanding general of the army in question. Uh, although core commanders can also issue orders as well as division divisional leaders. Um, uh, the as far as the cost of the order goes, uh, every leader in the game has a command value. Going back to the uh, going back to the the game for a second. There is a chart. Um, that I have to find. Oh, orders and command here. Uh, command points. Um, so uh, so every leader. And the game has a rating from 0 to 4, and these are the corresponding number of command points that are available based on the, the, the rating of the leader. Uh, in this game, Bragg has a command value of 0, and Rosencrantz has a command value of 1. Uh, so every turn, uh, Bragg will have 8 command points at his disposal, and Rosencrantz will have 12 command points at his disposal. Uh, so when we're so when we're writing orders, so when Bragg is writing orders, he's going to write uh, oops. He's going to write orders keeping in mind that he's got 8 points to use. Um, and I've got uh, some shorthand here that basically lays out what the the different considerations that determine the cost of an order. Um, uh, one choice uh, the person issuing the order has to make is whether they want to issue a simple, whether they're issuing a simple order or a complex order. Uh, the terminology here isn't very indicative of what's intended here. Basically, here, and I'll go back to the map, a simple order, like the paradigm of a simple order will be the order that, for instance, Negley down here will move, well, it is currently under. That's the order just to march in column from one location to another. Um, notice that no, nowhere in the order is there any indication that Negley has any permission to, 
to engage the enemy or you know take an active role in engaging the enemy that's the paradigm of a simple order typically i'm only going to order i'm only going to issue a simple order when i think there's zero chance uh that the uh that the units in question will encounter the enemy uh before they get to their destination i suppose zero chance is a little bit of an exaggeration because you know of course in reality there's always the possibility of you know the cow uh, the enemy uh, cavalry appearing but uh but yeah but in this situation here um i, I would i would say it would definitely be allowable for if I hadn't already issued the order, I would issue Negley a simple order to move from here to here. Maybe a good way to think of it is uh, throughout the the, the 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 travel distance here, Negley is screened by by friendly troops. Um, so whereas um, as we'll see in a few turns, I am going to order Preston's division to move from this area to this area. Um, that would be a complex order, even though I'm not telling Preston to attack explicitly to attack anyone. There's still, of course, a significant chance that Preston would encounter the enemy um, on his journey. And furthermore, uh, my order will be such that Preston would be expected to capture this crossroad uh, if it is occupied by the enemy. Uh, so that will have to be a complex order when I issue that order. Um, and so that affects the cost. Uh, a, co a simple order costs one towards the, we'll count one towards the eight uh, points that Bragg is allowed, whereas a complex one will, um, will cost uh, three. And then the other decision that uh, a, com a commander has to make when issuing an order is they have to decide whether it's going to be an oral order or a written order. And essentially the difference between the two in game terms is, again, I'll go back to the map and let's look at the, uh, the order cost, uh, sorry, the... Uh, the order acceptance chart. Um, what we're ultimately going to determine uh, through a certain, um, uh, th using this formula here, is the column that we're going to roll on to determine what, what happens to the order uh, once it's received. Um, and from the order standpoint, they want to be as far, to, they want to be on a column that's as far to the right as possible. And the way the formula works out, you'll see that uh, an oral order is a minus one, so that's going to tend to move the column that we roll on for acceptance to the left, whereas a written order will tend to push it towards the right. Uh, so, in other words, written orders have a higher chance of being accepted, you know, on average than an oral order does. Um, um, it is ultimately um, the player's decision whether to issue the, whether to make the order in question an oral order or a written order. Um, generally speaking, this isn't in the game rules, generally speaking, if I'm writing a really complicated order, it's going to automatically be written. Um, that's just the way I play, because um, you know you wouldn't expect an aide, the aide that you send out to deliver an oral order, to be to you know remember a you know a really detailed order. Um, but but just from strict game terms, it's it's just the player's decision. And we'll see. Uh, I think when we get to Rosencrantz's turn to issue orders, he'll be issuing some oral orders rather than written orders. Um, so what I've decided to do, is going back to the order chart, so you'll see that a written order costs five and an oral order three. Bragg has eight. Um, I mean, what, what most of the orders you're going to issue, most of them, um, Certainly in the scenario we're playing, especially with the limitations we're playing with, most of the orders are going to be, um, they're almost all going to be complex um, because they're all going to 
almost all of them are going to presuppose the possibility of combat. Um, and so, so Bragg, he only has eight to spend. He's so he's generally going to be starting with three. Um, so, so, so even an oral order would cost a total of six, you know, three plus three is six, um, would only leaving him with two, which would not allow him to issue another order anyway. So long story short, Bragg is going to be issuing a lot of complex written orders in this playthrough, just because it, he's basically going to be using, you know, his maximum of eight command points every turn he issues an order. Um, and so that's what I've got down here. The method and the type, as I said, is written complex. And then the orders, this is the 1400, you know, the 2 p.m. game turn. So this order is being sent at 1400. Um, now, what happens is then the the order is sent out well, then, then at, that, that, at that point, the order is sent out. Now, I've decided, going back to the game, I've decided to send an order to First Corps first. And the the time that this order, so the order is sent out, uh, it's sent out along this road. That's the most economical path from the uh, standpoint of uh, uh, aid or command movement points. Uh, you determine the number of turns it takes the order to arrive by counting the number of leader movement points it takes to move there. That You divide that by 10. You round up to the nearest highest multiple of 10 and then that's the sorry the yeah multiple of 10 and then that gives you the number of turns. So uh, I've already counted it out. It's like nine leader movement points from here to from the Army of the Tennessee headquarters. Uh, and Bragg does need to be located in his command in his command HQ in order to issue this order. Um, and then the order, uh, and which he is, um, and then the order. Then the aide spends nine movement points to get here, nine rounded up is 10, um, uh, which translates into one turn. So that so this order, the order that we're sending out to First Corps at 1400 will arrive uh, at First Corps headquarters at 1430. So I will put that on our chart. So, um, Oh, no, oh, I've got it here already. So, uh, so it is scheduled to arrive at 14:30, and when it arrives at 14:30 at First Corps uh, headquarters, then, um, then we will start the process of determining what happens when that order arrives. Will it be immediately accepted, or will there be a period of delay uh, before the order is implemented? There's also a chance that the order will be you know, distorted um, or lost or whatever um, and not implemented at all. And so a new order would be required. Uh, so we'll see that process play out in, uh, later on. Um, so, so, uh, but uh, Bragg has sent this order to First Corps and the order is pretty detailed. Let me, I'll uh, just first maybe graphically just show you my plan for first core, which is pretty detailed. Um, so there's two divisions in first core. There's Johnson's uh, Johnson's division, and of these three brigades, there's a there's a brigade under Johnson, and then Law's division here, consisting of two brigades, um, and there's also three units of artillery. Uh, belonging to First Corps. So in a nutshell, my plan, and it's going to, I'll go into more detail later, but in a nutshell, my plan for First Corps is I'm going to send these two brigades of Johnson's division this way to directly engage these units. Um, I'm, I'm going to use law I'm going to take law's division and swing them around to Johnson's right to protect Johnson's flank from Reynolds 
Um, and their orders will allow them to engage Reynolds if Reynolds does indeed, uh, you know, move towards move towards Johnson. Um, I'm going to take the three three artillery units uh, of First Corps and set them up. I haven't made a comp uh, final decision, but somewhere along here, um, so that they're able to bring fire on Davis's right flank. Um, another thing that uh, probably the actual his first corps commander would not have known, but I know because as a player I can obviously see the whole game map, is while there's very strong uh, uh, brigade here is lurking in the shadows, and could, uh, it would be simple for them to come up and support Davis when I support Davis's division when I attack it. Um, so that's another reason I'm bringing my artillery up here uh, um, uh, to, you know, to be able to bring more firepower to Davis's right. Um, and then I will bring this uh, Greg's brigade down here. I will bring them down here to support those artillery units because generally speaking, you don't want um, artillery to be setting up all by themselves. Uh, you want to have uh, uh, infantry uh, supporting them, and that's uh, um, and I'll explain later how that's how that idea is uh, uh, expressed in game terms. So, looking at the written order that I, that I've given, um, it says move first. Oh, and before I read the order, just one more thing. The challenge in all of this is making sure that at the always at the end of movement, all of my units are within their command radius because uh, you know once First Corps gets its orders, the units in First Corps will not be allowed to act on those orders if they're outside of the if they if the if the brigades don't meet and the division leaders don't meet their command radius requirements. Um, so the trick is to have all these pieces moving, and at the end of each. Uh, turn to have the resulting units still in their command radius so that on the subsequent turn they can continue to execute the orders. This is going to take like, my plan is pretty elaborate here, it's going to take two or three turns for everything to be put together before it's put into action. Um, and so so it's, it's going to be a bit of a challenge to make sure that I'm always respecting command radius and, and moving all these units. Uh, so uh, I think I've got it figured out how I can do it, but uh, we will see. So that's the order that, so Bragg is done writing orders, uh, issuing new orders. So let's go back to our sequence of play. Um, we've issued new orders. Uh, core, the next step is core attack stoppage checks. Um, I'll talk more about core, stop, core stoppage a little bit later. Um, the next phase is initiative order determination. Um, there is every leader in the game has the cap has the ability to roll for initiative, and which and if they if they succeed in rolling for initiative, then that would allow them to essentially cancel any orders that they've already received or are operating under and substitute those with orders of their new choice. Um, and the success or failure of that command roll is generally based on the leader's uh, rating. Uh, so, you know, Stewart is rated a four, Johnson a three, Law two, Hood is rated a four. That's the highest you can be. Hood, Hood is the, uh, again, the uh, Corps Commander of First Corps. Uh, and there's a chart. Uh, the initiative chart uh, that tells you, um, you know, what what die roll counts as success. You roll two d six, uh, and so a four, like Hood, would need on a two d six would need to roll a nine or higher to to successfully, uh, you know, to you know, to be able to stop acting on the orders he's currently working under and to issue himself and his command 
uh, which would be first core in this case, a new order. Uh, so you can see it's not easy to get initiative. You, you know, as generally speaking, as the, I mean, each player, you know, controlling an army wears different hats at different times, but the, probably the most important hat, uh, the, a given player wears is that of the overall army commander. But, you know, when you're wearing that hat, you can't, you certainly can't count on your subordinates to, you know, to successfully roll for initiative. Um, if it, you know, even if it totally makes sense in, in the circumstances for them to try, just because, you know, it, it is not easy to get initiative, uh, even with the highest possible leader rating. Uh, so you can't always count on a leader, a, a subordinate leader uh, getting initiative to bail you out of the poor or no longer relevant orders that you issued them. Uh, Right now, so right now, the only leader on the Confederate side that would be eligible to roll for initiative is Stuart, because that I forgot to show you on the order chart that Stuart starts the scenario with the order to. Uh, this is uh, uh, this is uh, Stuart's division here. So send Stuart's division to attack the Union Center between the Brotherton and Brock houses. That order is in effect at the start of the scenario, is an active order. So when it comes time for, and that time is soon, for Stuart to start moving, he, he when we reach the movement phase, Stuart will start moving according to that order. Stuart is the only uh, conf Confederate command on the board right now with an active order. So if Stuart wanted to, Stuart could roll for initiative in this phase. Again, this is the initiative phase. We're in the initiative order determination. So Stuart would be allowed to roll for initiative at this point, but I, as the Confederate player, don't want him to do that. I want him to, basically what his orders are telling him to do is to attack these units here. Uh, and that's what I, and that's still what I want him, that's what I want him to do. So I will not be uh, 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 rolling for initiative at this point. The next step is delay reduction. Uh, that's for orders that are already arrived. When it, so at 14, at 1430, the next and, and turns in Baron Victory are half hour turns. So the next turn will be the 1430 turn. Uh, the order will arrive. The order that we wrote this turn will arrive at First Corps headquarters. And then when we reach de the delay reduction step in the 1430 turn, that's the point in the sequence where we will see what happens. Well, actually, no, I take that back. Um, that's for delay reduction is for orders that have already gone on that have already undergone the next step which would be new order acceptance arrived this turn so I misspoke before so during the 1430 turn uh, uh, the order that we wrote this turn will arrive at first core headquarters and then we will uh, we will roll we will roll for new order ac acceptance at that time. Uh, there's no orders um, that we can roll for delay reduction right now, and new or no orders uh, are arriving this turn, so we're just going to ignore these two steps uh, and move on to the movement and close combat phase. Um, the first step in movement and close combat is straggler recovery place marker placement. Uh, I don't have any, there are uh, none of the Maybe this is a good time for me to stop and talk about representing the uh, strength levels of the various units in the game. So I will close, minimize this. You've probably noticed already that there are no strength markers either on the counters. There's no strength information on the counters and there are no markers in the stacks. The way you track your uh, the strength of your units and your losses are through loss charts. So let's look at the loss chart for the Army of Tennessee. Um, so, uh, so every brigade in the Army, 
and there's a lot of them. This is a big battle. Um, is is listed here. So so these are the different. These are the. So right now we're looking at Stewart's uh, division, the division that we're going to move in the movement phase. Uh, Stewart has three divisions uh, led by by Bait, by Brown, and by Clayton. Um, these are their fixed morale ratings. Uh, Bait has a morale rating of A. Brown and Clayton have ratings of C. That's going to play a role in what happens a, a bit later. Um, and then this here, this information here, each row of squares here basically represents the different possible strength, uh, strength levels of each unit. Uh, the letters here, like A, B, A, B, C, correspond to the amount of firepower that the that the uh, that the unit potentially has. Um, so bait here starts out with A, B level of firepower, and the way to understand that is like A plus B. So it's A and a bit more. Two Bs equal an A. Two two Cs equal a B. Uh, so that's how that works. So this is like, so so bait essentially starts out with like A and half an A of firepower. However, if if through combat bait accrues either a loss or a straggler, then we'll mark this square and that will bring him already down to an A fire level. And then uh, after losing a lot more, after losing five more, either permanent losses or stragglers, that would be bring bait down to a B fire level, um, and obviously the fire levels correspond to the amount of damage you can uh, put on the enemy through firing. Um, the check mark here represents when the brigade is wrecked. Um, uh, when a brigade is wrecked, uh, it loses a lot of its ability to uh, to sort of stay in stay in place when fired upon. That is, it's a lot easier to get a retreat result bef uh, after a unit is wrecked than before it's it's wrecked. And the way we, um, well, we can look at what we're, what's all, what we start the scenario with. Uh, so for instance, looking at GIST division here, this is, we're not going to be in, in this video or this uh, series of videos, we're not going to be uh, working with 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 gist at all uh, but gist has already incurred a lot of casualties uh, earlier on in you know before the scenario started um, so the red x's represent uh, permanent losses and the blue slashes represent stragglers so there is a potential for wilson to get back through straggler recovery get back up to back up to a fire level um sorry no they don't they can't do that because even if they recover all three uh they would still be their all their a's would be x'd out so they would still be at b fire level uh let me find a uh, well uh if there like if there was a uh a blue slash here instead of a red X, then if they if they were able to recover four stragglers, that would be a lot. But if they were able to, then that would bring them back up to a fire level and also make get them back from wrecked to non-wrecked. Uh, right now, Wilson is considered wrecked because he's incurred more losses. He's incurred losses to the right of the check mark. Uh, and again, losses are either permanent losses or stragglers. So right now, uh, Wilson's division is wrecked. Um, um, so that's that's how we uh, track losses in a Civil War Brigade series game. All, all the games have these loss charts. And when I first started playing this series, I really didn't like the idea of the loss charts because, you know, it's another piece of paper that you have to, uh, you, you know, Put information on you know not all the information is found on the actual game board but as i played more with the system i came to find that what i really like about uh the lost charts is just you see the the very attritional nature of civil war battle is i can't think of a more graphic way of really of representing it than than this i mean you just see the slow 
uh, accrual of losses as as battle progresses um, in a way that you don't see simply by you know, in other systems, you might, you know, a counter might start at full strength, and then at a certain point, it flips to half strength, and then if it occurs more losses, then it goes into some kind of recovery phase where, you know, pro you know probably off map or something like that. Um, here you see it just, you know, the, the uh, just like a finer gradation of losses, and it really brings home the, the very attritional nature of uh, Civil War combat. So, but we don't have any strike of the of the of the commands that we're going to be focusing on. Uh, none of them have stragglers that are that need to be recovered or anything. So we're not going to place any um, uh, straggler recovery markers. So now we're at the movement phase, and uh, right now the again the only command in the Confederate army or the portion of it that we're looking at that is under an active order is Stuart's Brigade. Sorry, Stuart's Division. So Stuart's orders are to take his division and it's, it's said to, you know, essentially attack and take the, the Lafayette Road between the Brotherton and the Brock House. Uh, so, so what Stuart is going to do is, um, there's different ways of interpreting that, and that is a feature of this game, is that, you know, that order gives Stuart some latitude about what to do. Uh, what I'm having Stuart do here is very close to what uh, Stuart's division did historically. I think historically, uh, Stuart's division kind of attacked in this area right here, so it did engage Van Cleese's division as well as, I think, this brigade right here, Gross's division. Um, the, but these units, remember, are not going to be in play for purposes of our playthrough. Although I am going to respect the uh, zones of control of of uh, of these units, so I will not be taking my units like... Uh, essentially, I'm not going to take these units, you know, farther north than this uh, this row right here, this row of hexes right here. Um, at least not through here, because, uh, well, I'm oversimplifying a bit, but that's my plan. Anyways, um, now my, so there are three brigades in Stewart's division, and none of them have artillery. And opposing me is Van Cleve's division of three brigades. And Beatty's division has five units of artillery. So Van, Van Cleve's division has more firepower than my division does. Um, I've got two AB level firepower brigades and one A. Or, sorry, no, I've got three ABs. Um, this is an AB. That's an A. If, if there is no, if you don't see any, like, uh, you know, orange marker with letters in it, that means it's an A fire level. The sort of the default, as it were, is that the, the brigade has an A fire level. And then if it has something different than that, there'll be a counter expressing that. So I guess um, I'm a little bit, Stuart is a little bit ahead of Van Cleve in that I've got three ABs and Van Cleve only has two, but five units of artillery is vastly more stronger than um, as we'll see, then a 1B fire level. Um, another thing I should mention, this is a good time to mention, is that although, like, you know, uh, Brown's division here has A, B fire level, the most fire, like, the highest fire strength that can be shot out of a given hex is A, a infantry fire level and up and five artillery uh, fire points. Um, so while Brown's division here does have a B fire level, when I engage in fire combat, um, it can only fire at a level because that's the maximum I, that's determined by, you know, the frontage basically. Um, 
Um, another, uh, another factor that, I'm, that I'll talk in more detail about, but I can start to introduce now, is the, I already alluded to it when we looked at the, uh, the loss charts, is the intrinsic morale level of each unit. Uh, and one, and we can look at that on the loss charts, or if we flip each unit. And I should say that for an infantry unit, if it's on this side, the side with its like, you know, where its state is showing, um, that's its line side. And then if you flip it, that's its column side. But it also shows, well, it shows his starting strength level and his. Uh, intrinsic morale rating. So, so this brigade here has the highest possible morale rating is an A. Uh, I believe the other two are Bs. Oh, sorry, this is a C morale, uh, intrinsic morale rating. And this brigade here is, oh, so it's two Cs and an A. Okay. Um, so of the three uh, brigades, Bait has by far the best uh, morale rating. And so my plan for like overcoming the greater firepower of Van Cleve's division is I'm going to start by bringing um, my A-level brigade and bring it into close contact with not with this brigade that has all the artillery, but this one, which has no artillery. And I know, you know, I shouldn't know this as Stuart, but I know it as the game player. It has a D level uh, intrinsic morale, which is the worst. Um, um, and that's, that's a different, that difference in morale rating will play a big role in determining what happens when, uh, if I were to bring bait into melee or close combat with this. So my plan, in short, for uh, for Stuart, at least for the start of Stuart's attack against Van Cleef's division, is to bring, is to try to work on Van Cleef's left first, keeping the other two brigades uh, kind of in reserve, until hopefully I'm able to push through close combat. Uh, this brigade back from the line, and then hopefully then I can bring uh, superior firepower uh, onto this brigade here. Uh, boy, it's hard. Dick's brigade, um, and again staying away from this brigade here, which has all the firepower. Um, now we'll talk about whether. Uh, 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 Van Cleve can redistribute his artillery um, uh, when we get to the the, the Union turn. Uh, so right now uh, I'm going to move Stewart's division with a mind that my first goal is to bring Bates's brigade into close combat with this brigade here. Um, and uh, infantry brigades in line when they're in line, it costs two movement points to move into a woods hex, and it costs one point to cross a uh, stream like this. So, uh, so let's count movement points. So it'll be two from for bait. It'll be two, four, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Because this one is clear, so it costs one. But when I enter this hex and, and engage in close combat, uh, that costs an extra movement point as well. So it will take me a total, it'll take bait a total of 13 infantry line movement points to achieve close combat with this brigade. And since bait has a maximum of six uh, movement points each turn, it's going to actually take me three turns to get bait from here to where he's actually engaging in close combat with uh, Barnes's brigade. So I'm going to start by just moving bait, his two, four, six. That's his maximum allowance. Then the next turn, I'll move him probably just here. And then in the third turn, I'll make the final push into there. Um, this is probably a good opportunity for me to talk a little bit about line of sight 
uh, as it pertains to uh, ar ar artillery fire and infantry fire. Um, long story, well, not even really long story, but uh, its its line of sight is pretty simple in this game, actually, uh, at least as far as the woods goes. Notice that um, this whole area here has the same base, you know, this light kind of uh, putrid green color there, uh, the same base level um, of elevation, and some of the hexes are woods and some aren't. Um, in this game, you can always fire out of a wood hex. You can always fire into a wood hex, but long, but but putting it very simply, you can't fire through a wood hex. So, for instance, on my second turn, if I were to move Bates Division here, then Bates would be subject to fire from both of these uh, brigades. Um, even though this is a wood hex, because you can fire into wood hexes. However, so in order, to, and which would put Bates as a disadvantage, because Bates has, could bring an A-level firepower, but both of these brigades are A, are A firepower as well, could bring A fire, so we'd have two A's going up against one. Uh, Bates doesn't want to do that. Bates at a disadvantage there. So for my second turn, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop here because because that, then uh, these two brigades, and as well as this one, will not be able to reach Bate, Bates's brigade through fire because these woods hex, hexes will block it. Now I'm sure you've noticed already that some of the hexes have, you know, are partially filled with woods. Um, uh, uh, what do we do about those? Uh, what the rules say is you should consider any hex with at least 50% woods as a woods hex and less than 50% a non-woods hex. Um, so for instance, I would regard this hex to be a non-woods hex for firing purposes, even though there is some woods in the hex because it's less than 50%. So I would consider there to be like a clear line of fire between, say, this hex and this one, even though there's a little bit of woods here. This is more than 50%. These are more than 50%, obviously, so these all count as woods hexes. Um, so uh, so I've moved bait already, although this is where I'm moving bait to. Uh, I'm going to move brown here as well. Uh, stacking limits in this game are you can have up to th three A's, three A levels stacked in a given hex of infantry, and I'm I'm at that limit here because remember two B's equal an A, so I've got three A's here, and up to uh, fifteen uh, string points of artillery in one hex. Uh, although as far as like fire level allowable fire levels go. Um, only up to, up to five uh, artillery points can fire out of a hex, can fire out of, of a given hex, even if more than five are stacked in the hex. Um, and then, um, so I moved two brigades of Stewart's, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Stewart's division, and so I'm going to move the last one. It's six. And now something that's always important to think about as you're moving the units in a command is. Um, at the end of movement, uh, command radius should should be should be obeyed, and I've achieved that here because the command radius requirements for a division is that the brigades in a division can be no more than four leader movement points away from the divisional leader, um, and these two brigades are two leader movement points away from Stuart, and obviously the brigade underneath Stuart is you know zero movement points away so so Stuart's brigades have met their command radius requirements and something I should have emphasized earlier when I was talking about Stuart's order let, let me go back to my order chart when talking about Stuart's order is that uh, well I, I could have been I could have actually uh, stated this more precisely um, and I'll put this in the notes here um, this is a divisional goal.
And the reason why that's important is because the fact that it's a divisional goal allows Stuart to not be subject to the normal command radius requirements to his uh, his core HQ, which is Buckner's uh, core HQ down here. Um, I'm a lot more than eight. At this point, Stuart is two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen leader movement points away from uh, Buckner Corps headquarters, which is outside the allowable limit. But the fact that Stuart has been Stuart's division has been given a divisional goal means that there Stuart is essentially functioning as an independent command, uh, not subject to normal control by Buckner and the command apparatus of Buckner's Corps. Um, so now I've, so Stuart's division has completed its move. Again, those are the only, um, those are the only units in the, in the portion of the Army of the Tennessee that we're looking at that have actionable orders. Of course, it would be nice if I could get Hood's division and, or sorry, Hood's Corps and Preston's division on the move right away, but that's not the way this game works. They can only move after they've uh, received and then implemented an order to take action. Um, and so we're done with the movement section. And... I closed it, it looks like. We're going back to the sequence of play here. So we've done movement and there is no close combat. Um, that's possible yet, so we're just going to skip that. Uh, ammo resupply, we may not be doing a lot of that in our playthrough today. Um, and now we're at the fire combat phase. Um, so, uh, and the way fire combat works in this game is first the non-phasing player gets to make all of their, all of the fire combat that they're eligible to make, uh, followed by the phasing player. Now, let me minimize here, maybe, Oops, maybe move out, move out a bit. Um, right now, there are, uh, oh, um, the only fire combat, let's see. There's no eligible fire combat here um, because that's blocked by all these woods and None here because, I mean, even leaving range aside, there's way too many woods between these units and these units or these units and these units down here. Um, I'm oversimplifying a little bit, but the range is so extreme here that I, I don't think it's actually uh, possible. Um, uh, but let's look at Hood's, Hood's Corps and Davis's division a little bit more closely. I hadn't really noticed this before. But I do see that there is some eligible fire here. Um, in looking at this before, I've decided, uh, no, uh, regarding these two hexes here, this one and this one, I've just, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to estimate. If I had to guess, I would guess that there's slightly less than 50% woods here. So I've decided that this hex is considered open for fire combat purposes. Uh, as well as this one. It would actually be helpful to the Confederates if these were considered wooded hexes because it would make their approach safer, but as we'll, as we may or may not explicitly discuss later. Uh, but I've, long story short, I've decided to consider both of these as open. This hex does have clearly more than 50% woods, so this one is considered a woods hex. Um, so I see one element here where fire is eligible uh, between uh, Davis's brigade and uh, the 20th Corps artillery in this hex and Greg's division here. Um, and so first we will, we will 
uh, and, and both units will want to fire at each other for the obvious reasons. And so first, Davis's uh, units here, just in this hex, not in, let's see. Oh, um, since this isn't a woods hex, oh, I'm just noticing all this. Um, this is not a woods hex. These units also have line of sight into this hex. Remember that it, the fact that there are woods in the firing hex or woods in the target hex is irrelevant. You ignore that. As far as woods, in other words, as far as woods go, the only woods that you're interested in are woods that are between the firing hex and the target hex. Now, if there are elevation changes here, that would that would be an additional consideration. But obviously, the base elevation in all these hexes is the same. Um, so, so the fact that this is not a woods hex means that all of these units are eligible to fire at Greg's brigade. Greg's brigade, in turn, is eligible to fire at Davis. So we are going to get to do some fire combat this this turn. Um, So, going to our fire combat tables in the for the game, uh, we start by determining the number of fire points that each side can bring to bear on the other one. So, first we're going to, the non-phasing player, that is the union, will do its fire combat. Um, so... Carlin's brigade here is it is a, it's a B level, but remember only the A is the highest level of firepower that can be fired out of a hex uh, at once. So so um, oh I I'm forgetting some I forgot something um, infantry fire has a maximum range of two. Uh, whereas artillery has a longer range. So actually, the two infantry units in these two hexes are out of range of Greg's division and vice versa. So the actually, the only unit that is eligible to do any fire combat in... in this phase is these five artillery points, which is... For illustration purposes, it's fine. Um, so artillery fire points are determined on this table. Uh, the x-axis is the number of gun points. That's five. The y-axis is the the range. Uh, the range is obviously three hexes. So we're on this column. So so these artillery units can fire at level three. Um, can fire three three like fire points, as it were, uh, out of this hex into this one. Uh, and then once we've determined that, we go to the fire combat table, and the, th the three fire points puts us on this column here. Uh, so we're going to roll 2d6 to determine the results of that fire combat on this three to four column. Um, and these are all the modifiers. Uh, let's see, there's no slope involved, no sunken road or trench, it's not night, no one is low ammo, target is column, limbered, flanked, disorganized, or routed. The, this, Greg's Brigade is not in column, it's in line. If it were flipped on this side, then it would be on column, and that would move us to up, up the... Uh, um, the, the fire point table, but it isn't. Uh, so we don't do that. Uh, it's not a mounted target. Um, and uh, and it's not a close combat and attack from a flank. Uh, so there are not going to be any modifiers that apply here. Um, so we will roll a 2d6. Well, actually, there's a, there's a, a series of dice we're going to roll, and the and the module nicely uh, consolidates all the different die rolls that you have to do for fire combat uh, into one one click. Uh, so I click up here, and I'll then I'll walk you through the process. So let's see what happens. All right. So these are our two combat dice here. So five and a five is obviously a ten. So that means that. 
on the we're on the three to four column. So so the initial loss suffered by Greg's brigade is one and a half. Now what we do with the half in the Civil War brigade system is we look at the uh, we look at the rounding dice. In a physical copy of the game, this is just a d6, and if we roll a four, five, or six, we round up. If it's one through three, we round down. So here we're rounding up, so that means that Greg is actually going to lose, have two permanent losses, suffer two permanent losses as a result of this fire combat. That's pretty bad. Uh, stragglers are determined independently of of losses, of, of permanent losses. Uh, we rolled a three, our straggler die is a three. Uh, we look at the straggler table. Um, our initial fire loss was one and a half or more. So we're on this table. If our initial fire loss was a half to one, then we'd, we'd look at this table. Uh, if we didn't lose anything, then there would be no stragglers. So our straggler roll is a three and Greg's, we need Greg's morale. Greg's mor permanent, mor you know, um, constant morale is a B. So we're on the B column. We rolled a three, so that's one. So Greg, Greg's brigade loss a had suffered a total of two permanent, and two permanent losses and one straggler. So we're going to go to our Confederate loss table. Find uh, Greg's uh, brigade which is here, and we're going to go here. You get these X's and slashes. Uh, I'm not going to, I'm going to try not to talk too much about uh, Vassal here, focus on the game rather than Vassal, but it took, I actually needed to get help to figure this out. You get your supply of X's and slashes up here in, uh, in, by selecting lost chart markers, and then this is a slash, and then if you flip it, it's a, it's a red X. And you can, and once you've got one dragged over here, you can, um, you can select it and then clone it as much as you want, clone them as much as you want. Um, so again, going back to Greg, we're going to put, he suffered two permanent losses, so we're going to put two X's here, and then one straggler, which will go here. Uh, boy, not doing this very well. So that's a lot, and notice it takes him down all back down to it takes them all the way down to a level so i'm no so greg is no longer no longer has a b strength greg has a strength uh, so i'll close this as well as this and then i'm going to remove that a b counter just delete it uh, remembering that if there is no counter then that that means that the unit is at a fire level. So if, if Greg were to become depleted down to B level, then I would put a B level, I, I would put a B level counter in this hex. Um, so Greg took a lot of losses there from that artillery uh, barrage from uh, from the 20th Corps artillery. So um, so that's going to play a role down the line. Um, and Greg does now if 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 Davis were in, in, in range of two or less of Greg, now it would be Going back to the uh, uh, sequence of play, it would now be uh, the Confederates' turn to do fire combat. But since this is an art, Greg is all these units are infantry, and they're th these are three or more away. They're out of range of small arms fire, and so Greg does not have the opportunity to fire back on any of the units here. <coughs> So we're finished with our fire combat. Um, uh, there's two elements in the rally phase. There's straggler recovery, and then there's 
then there's the rally, the actual rally, uh, you know, component. Um, and we'll see that later on. Uh, what we do in the, the rally component is, you know, units can have uh, non-permanent morale states, or I think, I forget what the game calls them uh, collectively, but there are things like shaken, disorganized, routed. There's a process for rallying those different uh, morale levels away, um, and that's what happens in the rally the the rally portion of the rally phase. Um, and then the uh, Confederate uh, phase is done, or the component of the turn is done, and then the now will be the Union's turn to go through this entire uh, series of play before the uh, fourteen hundred turn is over. Um, in the interest of keep of the length of the videos, I think I'm going to stop the video here, and in my next video we'll go through the same se the same sequence of play for the fourteen hundred turn of the Union Army of the Cumberland. Uh, so, uh, and I hope to get uh, this video posted tonight and get a new video uh, out tomorrow. Uh, so thank you for watching and goodbye.